So we are turning to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, for the sake of just the passage being on our minds, let's read verses 14 and 15. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, says Paul to Timothy, but if I am delayed, I write to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church or the assembly of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Amen. Father, we ask your blessing upon the public reading of your word as we will try to consider this text and uh, the truths therein. And uh, we ask, Lord, that it would be applicable to our souls. Again, we pray that it would not just fill our minds with just new ideas, but that actually our hearts would be full in, the, in a way that we would be stirred to action and to greater devotion and love for you, and also to a greater courage to stand for your truth that has been revealed to us, that we would be uh, willing and able to contend for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. We ask it in the name of our Commander-in-Chief, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, well, with that text in mind, I... I want to just give a brief recap and intro uh, into this uh, message today. It is probably the last message on this mini-series that we are doing of God and government and, uh, you know, all the different questions that came up with that. Last week, we saw what our Christian responsibilities are towards our, the government, towards the powers that be, and just uh, the general rule and our basic posture that we take towards the, the rulers uh, of the nations, and our nation in particular, uh, the general posture being one of submission, one of even of obedience. We are, as Christians, to be model citizens and obey every just law, pay our taxes, and show honor and respect to whom honor and respect are due. Even pray, we considered that last week, pray and give thanks for those in power. And... Uh, we consider it also that it's not just the general rule, however, there is exceptions to the general rule, and uh, those exceptions are when obeying the ruler would mean disobeying God, we have to respectfully say we must obey God rather than men. And so we, we saw furthermore that uh, Christians have the right to flee persecution. They're not, uh, they're not uh, commanded by God to always have to uh, bow their head and, and suffer the consequences necessarily uh, of the persecutors, but uh, there is also the right to appeal to a higher authority, and, uh, and so on. There is, however, another responsibility that we didn't touch upon last week uh, that Christians have towards their rulers. And uh, you might, if you are careful, you might have kind of uh, maybe seen where I'm coming from with this text that we read. Uh, of the church being the church's duty to be the pillar and ground of the truth. And so um, this is what we will consider now. It is very tempting, isn't it, very often to be, as Christians, culturally and socially avoidant and uninvolved. I mean, like, just why bother? I mean, like, just different texts come to mind, and, and certain Christians, especially in certain groups, really like to emphasize those texts, which are great texts and great biblical truths. For example, John 17, we are not of the world. You know, we are of it, but we're not of the world. Um, or this world, 1 John 5, 19, this whole world lies in the evil one. I mean, it's going to hell. And so, uh, you know, why get involved? Or our citizenship is in heaven. It's not here on earth, it's in heaven. And, and people take that text and seem to, you know, use it in ways in which it was not meant to be used, as if, like, we're not responsible for anything that happens on earth, as if our bodies are somehow uh, not uh, walking on this earth, and so, therefore, we have no responsibility in this sphere. Or, Hebrews 11, we are sojourners and strangers in the world, just our, our, as our forefather in, in the faith Abraham was, and so, therefore, we are just passing through, we're not of here, we're gonna be gone soon, and so, those are truths, those are biblical truths, and yet if you just take them by themselves, you will become inevitably unbalanced, and uh, you will have an escapist theology uh, that, 
that he's expecting you to be, you know, for you to be zapped out of this world and out of any responsibility for what happens here. And you will become culturally uninvolved. And uh, that would be a good thing in your mind. Like the Amish, for example, or like a hermit, uh, hermit uh, you know, of the, of the Middle Ages or, or something like that. Um, so this is not a modern temptation. This is not something that only we as Christians now in the 21st century experience. This is uh, a temptation which was there even in David's day. I'll, if, you, if you want, turn to Psalm 11, because we'll use it as a case study for this. Uh, Psalm 11. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. And um, it begins like this. In the Lord I put my trust. How can, I, how can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. Now, verses 2 and 3 are actually the problem to, of the, that, that the psalmist presents to us. Look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrows on the string, and they might, sh they might shoot secretly at their upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's the problem. Do you see the wrong answer that someone gave the psalmist, that someone gave David? Verse 1, how, you know, he says, how can you say to me, how can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain, escape, run away. No point in fighting. No point in standing your ground. Just run. That was the wrong answer. The right answer is found in verses 4 to 7. Just look at me. Look, look with me at them. <laughs> the Lord, Yahweh, is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked... And the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. The point is, the foundations are not destroyed. God is in heaven, His throne has not moved, and the wicked will have their end in the lake of fire, and He will take care of them. Don't you worry about them. Don't retreat because of them. Don't be intimidated because of evildoers, says David to those who are fearful in Zion. And so uh, this is just a case study, as it were, of this uh, same thing that we are talking about here. The, the, the wicked are prospering. Look at the evil around us. It's everywhere. I mean, we're just pilgrims here. That's true. We're waiting for a city that comes from above, that has eternal foundations. That is true. But this is our Father's world, and Christ is our King, and He is the King of kings, and He has commanded us not only to live down here on this earth, but to actually spread His kingly message, His reign to all the nations to be bold witnesses of him to the nations. I mean, he has authorized us. Did we not consider that last week? He has authorized all power, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, I authorize you, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Uh, make disciples of all nations. Don't ask their kings first whether, they are allow whether you are allowed to convert them. No, you go there not with a sword, but with the gospel, and I will make sure that I bless that gospel. That gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all the nations. I have given you authority to do this, okay? That's what he says. I mean, that's not a new concept either. I mean, that's what we see in some other psalm. Psalm 96, verse 10, say, uh, verse 10 says, Say among the nations, or declare among the nations, the Lord, Yahweh, reigns, okay? The world also is firmly established and it shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples, plural, not just his people, the peoples righteously. So this is not a new concept, okay? <clears throat> this is something that has always been true. This is something that has always uh, been God's message that he will judge the nations, that he, he reigns over them. He, he has set his king on Zion's hill. Remember that was the 
the first uh, sermon that we did from this, uh, this uh, series uh, on God and government, uh, that from the second psalm, uh, how God is, you know, has established his king on Zion's hill, and even though the nations are raging and all the rulers are setting themselves against God and his anointed, against his Christ, God is laughing at them. He is laughing them to scorn. And uh, that, that we consider then how in verse 9 of Psalm 2 it said how he shall break such, such uh, nations, rebellious nations. W with a rod of iron he shall dash them into pieces as a potter's vessel. From Isaiah 3 we then looked at how God, you know, some of the signs of God judging a nation, God bringing down judgment upon a nation. And then I don't know if you remember in Psalm 2, we considered how the, la the end of the psalm says something like this. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Don't be rebellious. Be wise. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son. Honor the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Because, or blessed, are all those who put their trust in him. And so we maybe just mentioned very briefly in passing when we looked at those verses that it is the church's responsibility to be the instructing voice to the ruler. You know, be instructed, you judges, we said. You know, that, that is what Psalm 2, I'm not making this up, that's Psalm 2, okay? I'm just saying that this is the church's responsibility to instruct the ruler, to be wise, to tell him, watch out how you rule because you're, governship, government, or whatever, rulership, is under God, under His Christ. He has given you authority, and you have to be very careful how you discharge that authority. We looked at the scopes and the limits of, of uh, the, the government that God has established, and uh, when they go beyond that, how we ought to remind them of, of their limits and uh, their sphere of authority. We saw how, a few weeks ago, how when God judges a nation in Isaiah 3, it's, he seems to remove all the, all the sane voices from the land. And of course, the sanest of the voices being the church. The church often is removed or is brought low and weakened to the point where it becomes either silent or irrelevant. Does that remind you of any country that you know of? The church being irrelevant? It reminds me of this country. In 2013, evangelical Christians wrote to their MPs and protested the marriage bill of, of 2013, which was proposed by the government then, in which same-sex couples were legally allowed to get married. All those cries fell on deaf ears, and the proponents of this bill, led by Mr. David Cameron himself, went ahead and passed it. Oh, the, a bunch of churches are, you know, not happy with it. No big deal. It's just those Christians. No big deal. It's just like they, they, don't, they don't understand, uh, you know, progress. They don't understand equality. They don't understand. They are, they are dinosaurs, aren't they? They live uh, with their noses in their Bibles, and they don't really know what, what's going on. It's okay. The church is irrelevant, completely dismissed as a, you know, just some, you know, old lady down the road, you know, shouting at, Shouting at you from the other side of the pay, of the street, whatever, no, no interest. Or I was, uh, uh, I remember actually watching the news uh, when I was still living in London one day and uh, one morning, and well, I had my breakfast, and they were talking about the ordination of the first woman bishop in the Church of England, and and I was just uh, curious about it, and so I was just watching it there, and I think it happened in York Minster, I think that that's where it happened, and. Uh, and so, you know, there was very, you know, lots of pomp, lots of everything. And, uh, and then there was silence, and uh, this guy came up, and he was like, No, not in the Bible! <laughs> not in the Bible! It's an absolute impediment! And, uh, and then, you know, the guy who was leading the whole show is like, Well, it's, uh, I actually wrote down some of the things. He says, The consecration of a woman to the office of a bishop is now lawful under the canon of the Church of England, which means, da, 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 da. and so it basically, you know, have a seat. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, you, the Bible, <laughs> what do we care? It's lawful. That's, that's when the church, that's when the word of God becomes irrelevant, okay? That's, that's uh, what we considered a few weeks ago is 
one of the symptoms, one of the signs of God's judgment upon a nation. And the church, when it stops being that living conscience in the nation, uh, the only light in the cave goes out. And how great is the darkness then? When it stops shedding moral and spiritual light into the society. If those who know the truth are silent about it, ah, uh, how loud is the silence. We are commanded us Christians to speak the truth in love, not just to ourselves here in the church, or not just to our neighbor, unbelieving neighbor, but even to those in power, rulers and those in authority. Some theologians have called this particular duty of the church the prophetic voice of the church. Prophetic not so much because it speaks about future events, like some, you know, some of the prophets, they, they foretold future events, but because the prophets, what, what were they doing in the Old Testament? The prophets were exposing the sin of the nation and its rulers. They were warning of judgment to come. They were calling men to repentance. And they were coming essentially with a word from God. And that was, that they were the conscience of the nation. And the church today has inherited that ministry from them. So, don't really care how, what you think about pro, uh, prophetic uh, gifts and stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the church having a prophetic as a whole ministry in, in the world. This is not the task of ordained elders only. This is the task of the church altogether. All who have the Spirit of God. Remember Moses uh, back there in Numbers 11 when uh, he, he, he had enough. He asked that the Lord would, would share that burden on others. And he, so the Lord gave a, a portion of his Spirit to others and they were all prophesying. And, and so yeah, there was a problem that two of them were prophesying in the camp. And, and, and anyway, so Moses were like, oh. I just wish that all of God's people were prophets and God would put, their, put His Spirit on them. And you know what happened at Pentecost? That's what happened. God put His Spirit on all His people in a way, in a, in a way that was only true in the Old Testament of those specifically uh, de designated for a specific task. God now, you know, your young men, your young women, your old men, that's the prophecy of Joel and that happened at Pentecost. That, that's what Peter said. And so... Uh, that's, uh, that's the age in which we live. You, God's people, you are the prophetic voice of the church to the nations. So let's take a closer look at this passage that we just read now. I know that our brother Lawrence already kind of, uh, he exegeted some of it, but uh, let's, let's take a look at some of the words used here. Especially when it says, how, you know how to conduct yourself in the house of God of course, he's not talking about the temple here. He's not talking about a brick building or a stone building, which is the church or the assembly, the congregation of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. So first of all, the pillar or a support column, okay? I don't know. You imagine what, I, what, I'm, what this, this looks like. I mean, you've seen buildings with columns. I know that in most of the houses that you live in probably don't have columns, do, do they? Don't have, they have, some will correct me if I'm wrong, but they have load-bearing walls, yeah? Something like that. Okay, that's instead of a column. Well, if you knock out all the load-bearing walls, the roof's going to fall on your head. That's what they are there for. They hold up the rest of the house. They hold the roof in place, and, and um, otherwise everything collapses. It comes down. They are meant to carry the load of the building. And... Uh, Likewise, in a similar way, the church is to uphold the truth in society. Not all truth. The, the church is not responsible for mathematics, so to speak, but the truth that God has revealed. In this context, uh, Lawrence very, very correctly emphasized that this is specifically to do with the incarnation, the gospel, which is contained in those verses following. But on a more grander scale, it is the full revelation of God, the whole counsel of God. Who has God entrusted that to? To His people. If we do not, are, are not holding this up, who will? The, the, the Bible, who God is, the truth about who God is, who we are as fallen humans, what God has done for sinners like us, what, what sin is in the first place. What is the creation order and mandate that God has established for all humanity? 
what happens to those who do not obey the gospel? What happens after death? What is eternal life and how I can acquire it? All those, the answers to all those questions are found in the Bible alone. You know, there's not like 10 different opinions which are equally valid on those questions. God has revealed to us the answers to those questions, and we are responsible as His people, as the church, the congregation of God. We're responsible to uphold those truths. So you knock out the church from, from society, and uh, the truth will collapse. That's the point of this verse here, that the church upholds the truth. It's the pillar, <laughs> the pillar. It's like only there's only one pillar, <laughs> and you get rid of it, and guess what? The truth is coming down. It's collapsing. So we have that responsibility as Christians to guard it, defend it, and proclaim it. But it's, it's not just the pillar of the truth, it's also the ground or the foundation, the base, the buttress of the truth. It's like, it's similar to the load-bearing walls, but the foundation is, is, is a bit different, right? It, it's again, it's vital. I mean, again, in this country, you don't have earthquakes. There's not, no much, not much uh, se seismic activity. Uh, I don't think I've ever experienced an earthquake in this country, actually, for, for I don't know, 13, 14, 15 years or something. Uh, back in Bulgaria, lots of them. Well, not, not lots, lots, but uh, I mean, thankfully not too many. But uh, you, you experience them every now and then. And uh, that's why the foundations there are deeper and usually more, you know, more secure than here. Here, you don't really care that much about found foundations, but you still have them. I've dug up uh, the foundations on my house to see what they look like, and you still have them. And that's, it's important because if you, if you just start laying bricks around in, uh, you know, and start building the, just the walls without any foundations, what if one part of the house starts sinking or the, the ground under one part of the house starts sinking more than another part of the house and then you have a, a crack down the middle of the part eventually? So again, the foundations, very important. Well, the church provides that foundation of the truth in society. It doesn't just hold up the truth to, and by proclaiming it. It is also the foundation of its understanding. Who will guard God's revelation if not the church? Who's to say what it means if not the church? And by the church, I don't mean the institution. I mean God's people, those in whom God's Spirit dwells. The presence of a solid church, therefore, becomes an essential component of a healthy society and God-fearing rulers. Just laws can exist. Lies and injustice can be exposed. The gospel can be known. It's never gone down well in any nation, any society, when the church has been silenced or persecuted out of its boundaries. I read a, a, a story about the French Revolution, when uh, obviously all things Christian were beheaded, along with the abusive monarchs. And uh, there was a man by the name of Max, Maximilien Robespierre, I think that, well, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure how you pronounce that in French, but probably Robespierre, uh, something like that. And uh, he was one of the key figures in the revolution. And uh, you know what he came up with? He came up with uh, an idea of abolishing everything related to Christianity except its morals and its virtues. <laughs> Let's keep those. Those are good for society, but in, let's not call them Christian. Let's get rid of the church and Jesus and everything else and Christians, but let's, let's have the morals and the virtues they planted in midair, okay? That's how he, he saw it. And so he founded the cult of the supreme being, uh, which was supposed to be a replacement for Christianity. It was very short-lived. That's what happens when you try to get rid of the, uh, the, the church and, uh, or the, get rid of God's truth and um, get rid of Jesus. The, that, that is the, the thing that holds up the whole structure. That's the, the thing that holds up the truth in the first place. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't have God's truth without God's people uh, there. And so Paul calls it the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. He's not talking, as I said, about a building here. They didn't have buildings back then in which to gather. They were house churches. Uh, back in that day. Neither is he talking about a uh, institutionalized church. Oh, he's talking about the church, the R Roman Catholic church, or the Anglican church, or this church, or that church. No, no, he's talking about God's people. 
the congregation of the living God. He's talking about you. You are the pillar and ground of the truth. <laughs> if you don't hold it up, no one else will. And so, what is this prophetic duty as, as the church that we have? Well, it is twofold, I, I suggest. One is that sometimes we are, as, the, as it were, the counselor. You know, the prophet was to be the counselor to the ruler, in which he counsels the ruler what his duty is, reminds him of what his duty is as the ruler. And at other times, not just the counselor, but the condemner of the ruler, in which he rebukes the ruler for his sins and the sins of the nation which he has led the nation in. And we have examples of both of those duties in Scripture. First of all, let's talk about the, uh, the counselor. And let's talk about the prophet as the counselor, uh, directing the government to its duty. In 2 Kings 19, you have... Um, the, the narrative there is, uh, tells you about the siege of Jerusalem. I don't know if you remember. The siege of Jerusalem by the Assyrian army. That mighty army of the Assyrian king, Sennacherib, was at the walls of Jerusalem. And, and um, Sennacherib sent one of his, well, field marshals or whatever it's called. He's called Rapshak. I mean, people argue whether that was his name or just his title. But anyway, this guy, oh, he was full of blasphemies. And he came and started talking against the Lord God of Israel, and he was telling, he was convincing the people how, they, how their God is not on their side, and who of the gods of the nations that we have destroyed ever helped them. So you might as well just surrender, guys. And so that's, that was his attitude. And, uh, and King Hezekiah, who was one of the good kings, remember, he sent for the prophet Isaiah, and, uh, and the, the answer from the Lord through the prophet Isaiah was, trust in the Lord, do not fear the Assyrian army, and I will, I will destroy them without, them ever, without you ever raising a, a weapon against them. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. And because he listened to the advice of the prophet who brought a word from God to him, he did not seek help from the other nations. And it, it, it actually uh, affected how he ruled, okay? He... He was, he was uh, uh, established in, in the Lord. He was, he was, he was not fearful, and uh, he wanted to trust the Lord, and that gave the whole nation a desire to trust the Lord and do the same. And they did not fear the enemy. They did not surrender to the enemy. So here's an example of when the prophet is being a counselor to the king, and the king has ears to hear those, that advice, the counsel that the prophet comes with. Now, someone would... If you are careful here, you would be like, well, hold on, hold on, George. You're, <laughs> that sounds a bit, a bit worrying here. You, are you saying that the church has to be involved with the state in some kind of union there? I, shouldn't there be a separation of church and state? Absolutely. I believe in the separation of church and state, just not the separation of the state from God. Both the church and the state are under God. And when the state ceases to be the state and starts doing other things, it's the church's responsibility to address that and remind the state, the rulers, the powers that be, of their God-given duty. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that there ought to be some kind of coalition between the state and the, the church uh, or some kind of unholy marriage there between them. Not at all. Those are different institutions, God-ordained institutions, and they are distinct. In, they have distinct spheres of authority, okay? The, the, the church is not given the sword, for example, you know, the, the literal, literal sword. That's given to the state to punish the evildoers. The church is given the keys to the kingdom. They have different spheres of authority. Now, or the family, that's another, that's another institution that has its separate sphere of authority. So the church has its elders and the, the state has its kings and the family has its husband and father and those are uh, the, the heads of those uh, separate institutions. They have separate jurisdictions. They shouldn't overstep their limits of authority. For example, the elders of a church have no authority in people's individuals' homes. Although 
they can tell husbands slash fathers how they ought to rule their home, what God says about that. Likewise, they can tell the ruler how he ought to rule his realm. But they, they don't have more authority in that sense in people's house, uh, homes. Or the church. I mean, the church, it's great if the church has children's ministries. That's, that's wonderful. They can be a great help and a supplement to the teaching of, uh, you know, that parents bring to their children. But they do not replace, the church does not replace the parents in that. That is the duty of teaching, instructing, and disciplining, and training. The children is the parents. Now, if the church provides some kind of facility there and, and helps along with that, that's great. But that does not replace the parents' responsibility. Neither does the state, by the way, replace the parents. So it's not, it's not enough, good enough for you to think, oh, you know, I'll just give my children to the state because they'll take care of them. They are not supposed to. They are given to you. Now, you can delegate some responsibility here and there, but you've got to be very careful what you do with your children that God has given to you. And so when the state starts meddling in people's homes or in people's, or in the church, it has overstepped its limits of authority that are God-given. When the church starts, or sorry, when the state starts meddling with the church's affairs of doctrine, worship, and polity, then it has stepped over what it's lawfully by God allowed to do. And so, likewise, the church doesn't carry around a sword and uh, meddle with the affairs of the state uh, and uh, try to bring justice. You know, we don't, we are not vigilantes here. I didn't receive a phone call, you know, at some point earlier this week from number 10 Downing Street telling me what I need to be preaching on. And if I receive such a phone call, I'll probably not be listening to it. They have no business telling me how to, you know, what text of scripture to expound on or what the truth of God is. This is something that has been delegated to me and I have to be very careful because I'll stand before Christ one day and give uh, an account for what I have taught you. And I can't just say, well, it's okay because, you know, 10 Downing Street told me to do that. You know, they gave me this book of common prayer. <laughs> you know, remember that? 1662, the Act of Uniformity passed by English Parliament, uh, w which required all churchmen throughout this land to use the Book of Common Prayer for all their services and ceremonies. And many of the Puritans in that day refused to comply to that act, not because the book was heretical. There's, I don't know if you check it out, but there are some actual good prayers in it. I mean, it's not like I, I wouldn't use it, but there's things that are okay. It's not all bad, but simply the thought of government telling them what to preach on was something that they could not comply with. And that led to the great ejection in which over 2,000 or nearly 2,000 clergymen were removed or ejected from their official positions. Now, sometimes the spheres of authority overlap. Now, what happens then? I mean, that's interesting, isn't it? When, when one, one sphere of authority overlaps with, the, with another, let's say there's a crime that happens in the church, or an actual crime. That, that's now the sphere of authority of the state. I mean, they have, that, that, that's what they are supposed to do. They are supposed to protect human life. And if a crime happens here, which endangers human life or something, we are the first to hand over the culprit to the state. That is good. We're not hiding it because you know, that might be bad for our reputation or something. No, we're the first to give, give the culprit. We, we are uh, working together then. There is an overlap there. We understand that. We understand that. There ought to be that separation of church and state. But as we said already, that does not mean that the state is separated from God. No. It is under God. It is responsible to God. God has ordained its office. It, it has, he has ordained its duties, uh, as we saw in Romans 13 last week. And uh, the state is answerable. The ruler is answerable to God. So therefore, the, the church has a right, and not just a right, but a responsibility to 
tell the state if the state has gone beyond what it's supposed to do. You, you implement buffer zones around abortion care. You stop people from praying in their minds on the street in public. That's way beyond anything you're allowed to do. Any, how, can, how did that even cross your mind, stopping people from praying? That's back in Daniel what, uh, 5, or you know, the lion's den. Daniel, don't pray. What? Who are you to say to people don't pray? Don't kill? That's great. That's a good law. Don't pray? That's a bad law. That's not something that you have right to forbid. And, and at some point, you have to even go further and say, well, actually, it's not just that you stop people from praying. You're actually failing to do what you're supposed to do in protecting the unborn human life which was entrusted to your care. You, th those are citizens, essentially, which you're, you're failing to protect. You're even enabling those who take their lives and protecting them instead. So then how do we guide the ruler to his duty without overstepping the sphere of our authority as the church? That is a, a valid question, and uh, I'm not going to go into all the different ways in which that is possible. I mean, we live in a very unique situation now. It's not like we have an absolute monarchy and, and we cannot even suggest anything to the king without exposing ourselves to danger. We have the rights to vote, to write to the MPs, to write open letters, sign petitions, peacefully protest. All those are rights we have, and we should avail ourselves to some degree of them. That's not to say that that is the way to further the gospel. That is to say that that's your, those are your rights, and you can rightly and, and without fear even uh, do some of those things. Church leaders are to address some of those moral, ethical issues and help their people think biblically about them. So those are just some different ways of guiding the government to, the, to its duty, to its God-given duty. Now, secondly, and uh, that's my final point here, is that rulers sometimes don't have an open ear to the prophets' counseling. You know, they don't, they, they don't have time for the prophet's concerned advice. Then the ruler must hear the prophet's scathing rebuke. The church of God must take a more offensive approach and expose the sin called to repentance and warn of judgment, if not even pronounce the judgment. We are instructed in Titus 3, as we saw last week, that we are not to speak evil of anyone which includes rulers and those in power. But that does not mean that we are not to speak about evil or expose evil in them. Ephesians 5.11 says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather, well, expose them. And we see that throughout the Old Testament. If you are careful to read your Old Testament, especially the prophets, you'll see that happening over and over and over again. And I'll give you just three instances. I'll read three passages. You don't have to turn there. In which, first of all, the first one is in Isaiah. Isaiah instructs them. He just admonishes them, if you like. He instructs them, instructs the rulers of his day. Then, then we crank it up. Jeremiah rebukes them and warns them of judgment if that is to continue. And then you go even further and Micah pronounces judgment upon them. So Isaiah 1.17 says, Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Simple as that. That's my advice. That's God's word. You know, Jeremiah then rebukes them. Jeremiah 5.28 and 29 says, They have grown fat. They are sleek. Yes, they surpass the deeds of the wicked. They do not plead the cause, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. And the right of the needy, they do not defend. And it, if it, it's as it were, if that continues, shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? Do you see how it's you know, a step further now? Now, it's not just advice anymore. It is a rebuke. You are worse than the wicked. 
you do things that you are not supposed to be doing. And the things that you are supposed to be doing, you're not doing. Warning of judgment. And then Micah 3, verses 9 to 12, says the following. Now hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob. He's talking to rulers again. And rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and pervert all equity, who build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity. Her heads judge for a bribe, and her priests teach for pay, and her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord amongst us? No harm can come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins, and the mountain of the temple like the bare hills of the forest, pronouncing judgment upon a nation that has not learned, and rulers which have not repented. So you can see the prophetic voice here of the prophets. This is inherited by the church now. There is a time and place for the church to stand before a king who commits a crime and goes unpunished and say, you are the man, like David did to Nathan, or Nathan did to David even. There is a time and place to stand before an immoral ruler who claims to know God, claims to be Christian or whatever, and tell him, like John the Baptist said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your, father, your brother's wife. There is a time and place to stand before a wicked monarch accusing the church for the state of the nation and declare to him, I have not troubled Israel, you have. You and your father's house have, like Elijah did to Ahab, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. That's why you have troubled Israel, not I. It's not the church that's your problem. You are the problem. There is a time and place to stand before a pagan ruler and a persecutor of God's people and tell him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, like Moses did to Pharaoh. So those are the two general ways in which the church is to be a prophetic voice to those in power. It is to uphold the truth in a perverse generation and among godless rulers. You are that church. Not, not GFM in particular. I mean, you as God's people are that church. You are that city which is upon a hill which cannot be hidden. You are the salt of the earth, says our Lord Jesus, and the light of the world. And if that salt becomes savorless and that light grows dim, then we have lost our purpose for being here. You see, the, I want to warn of a danger before we close. And that's the danger of being all prophetic like that and exposing every sin and every evil in society and then having, at the same time, fellowship with that same evil in your heart. Did you catch what we read earlier, Ephesians 5? Have no fellowship with the, the deeds of darkness, the evil deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Some people go, some Christians even, uh, just hear the second part. Oh, yeah, exposing evil. We can do that. Oh, you know, the government is so evil. This is so evil. That is so evil. And they fail to see what's in their own hearts or mortify their own sin. Perhaps they don't even have the ability to mortify their own sin because they are dead in their trespasses and sins, but they're all very quick to judge others. Exposing the evil of pornography. Great. But don't be caught up in its snare all the all in the same time. That's not great. There's no power in that. Exposing the evil of abortion, that's great. But don't come up with excuses when it's someone close to you that gets pregnant unexpectedly. As evangelical Christians, we are very quick to uh, judge and uh, pass on judgment to the Roman Catholic Church. How can they follow the Pope blindly? And yet at the same time, some can, in the evangelical church community, can uh, uh, create popes in their own mind, which they never question. Be Berean. Question everything. Be biblical and 
compare with the Bible. I don't care whether you heard it from me or someone else, you know, Tim Conway or whoever else. Don't create popes in your head. Romans 2, Paul says, Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are, who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. He's talking, not to Christians here, he's talking about religious people. People who are, you know, have a holier-than-thou attitude. Uh, you know, who are, you know, goody two-shoes, whatever, you know, just, uh, they've got it all figured out. They can point out the mistakes and the errors in others very quickly, but they are quick, or they are very slow to, uh, fa to see and examine their own hearts. He all goes on to say, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. Then he goes on to say, and do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things in doing, the same, in doing the same that you will escape the judgment of God. He's obviously talking about Jews here who think they're better than the Gentiles just because they're Jews or just because they are the offspring of Abraham, even though they are, you know, essentially doing the same thing that the Gentiles are doing. And that's, of course, uh, an attitude which can be true even in church communities. Quick to point out at others and quick to, you know, but pass on judgment to others, but examining yourself, oh, no, that's not something we do. So don't be like that religious person here, but be like that person who examines himself first. He removes the beam from his own eye before removing the small speck in his brother's eye. That is always a healthy attitude. That's a warning because I don't want, I don't want uh, you, know, to go away, you to go away uh, from this message and think, okay, let me find out all the faults that the government has or all the faults that someone else has. All, that's not going to be healthy if you don't do that with yourself first. Condemning sin in others is not enough. You have to be mortifying sin in yourself. And you cannot be mortifying sin in yourself if you're dead in that sin. You need Christ to save you from uh, from that sin if you are not saved. You know, the, it, he alone can give you power. That, that's, that's, what we are, that's what we are talking about. I mean, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is not just that God justifies us through the gospel. It is the power of God to salvation. He shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Yes, even the power of sin. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you, the Bible says. Come on, this is what we have to be honest and real with ourselves. Does sin have dominion and power over your lives? Because if it does, then it tells me that, ah, man, you can, you can hear that message and be like, oh, yeah, we've got to point out all the evil things in, in the government, all the evil things in all that world system, one world system, everything that goes on. I have seen enough people like that, and there is no power in their life to overcome even their eyes overcome even their tongue. You know, you don't want to be there. Because you don't want to face God on Judgment Day and be like, Lord, did you see all my Facebook posts, how I posted about all the different evils in the world? And He's going to take your heart out and show you your own heart. You don't want to be there. You want to have, if one is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Not perfect, but new. And uh, that new nature will hate sin and will mortify sin and will look at itself first before it looks at others. May God help us to be like that. Otherwise, our actions speak louder than our words. And we have to be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Remember, that's what the Lord Jesus told his disciples. Don't be like the Pharisees. They tell you to do something and they don't do it. <laughs> don't be like them. Do first and then tell others. And by all means, you have the responsibility to tell others, especially those in power even, when they are overstepping their limits of authority. Let us make sure, brethren, that we, whatever we stand for is true first and foremost in our own hearts. May God help us. Father, we ask for this. We pray that you would make us a holy people, a people who kill, literally kill, mortify sin in our own hearts. All the evil, all the darkness. Oh, Father, we want to be such who have no fellowship with it whatsoever, but rather expose it. What good is it, Father, if we expose it in others and we have the fellowship with it in the same time? 
no, Father, we have we want to have no fellowship with darkness in our hearts whatsoever. Cleanse us from all iniquity, all unrighteousness, anything in our hearts. Lord, if there is anything in my own heart or in the hearts of my brothers and sisters here, expose it to them right this very hour so that they can come confessing to you. If they have recognized that they have never had power over sin, Father, give them the eyes to see and the hearts to feel their sin, their need of Christ, and may they run to Him today. Father, I pray that you would also make us bold and courageous in our stand for the truth, being a pillar, a bulwark, a, a, a buttress of the truth, that we would never budge, that we would be ready to even suffer the consequences for that, but that we would be courageous and bold witnesses of our Lord Jesus Christ until he has uh, the desire for us to stay here uh, and uh, takes us home. Father, help us in all those matters. In Jesus' name, amen.